The Mansion by Henry Van Dyke Part 2 But surely we won't quarrel. I'm very grateful to you, and we'll part friends. Good night, sir. The father held out his hand in silence. The heavy portier dropped noiselessly behind the sun, and he went up the wide, curving staircase to his own room. Meantime, John Waitman sat in his carved chair in the Jacobian dining room. He felt strangely old and dull. The portraits of beautiful women by Lawrence and Reynolds and Rayburn, which had often seemed like real company to him, looked remote and uninteresting. He fancied something cold and almost unfriendly in their expression, as if they were staring through him or beyond him. They cared nothing for his principles, his hopes, his disappointments, his success. They belonged to another world in which he had no place. At this, he felt a vague resentment, a sense of discomfort that he could not have defined or explained. He was used to being considered, respected, appreciated in his full value in every region, even in that of his own dreams. Presently, he rang for the butler, telling him to close the house and not sit up, and walked with lagging steps into the long library where the shaded lamps were burning. His eye fell upon the low shelves full of costly books, but he had no desire to open them. He dropped into the revolving chair before his big library table. It was covered with pamphlets and reports of the various enterprises in which he was interested. There was a pile of newspaper clippings in which his name was mentioned, but praise for his sustaining power as a pillar of finance, for his judicious benevolence, for his support of wise and prudent reform movements, for his discrimination in making permanent public gifts, the Waitman Charities, one very complacent editor called them, as if they deserved classification as a distinct species. He turned the papers over listlessly. There was a description with a picture of the Waitman Ring of the Hospital for Cripples, one of which he was president, and an article on the new professor in the Waitman Chair of Political Jurisprudence in Jackson University, of which he was trustee, and an illustrated account of the opening of the Waitman Grammar School at Dulwich on the Sound where he had his legal residence for purposes of taxation. This last was perhaps the most carefully planned of all the Waitman charities. He desired to win the confidence and support of his rural neighbors. It had pleased him much when the local newspaper had spoken of him as an ideal citizen and the logical candidate for the governorship of the state. But upon the whole, it seemed to him wiser to keep out of active politics it would be easier and better to put Harold into the run, to have him sent to the legislature from the Dulwich district, then to the National House, then to the Senate. Why not? The Waitman interests were large enough to need a district representative and a guardian at Washington. But tonight, all these plans came back to him with dust upon them. They were dry and crumbling like forsaken habitations. The son upon whom his complacent ambition has rested had turned his back upon the mansion of his father's hopes. The break might not be final, and in any event, there would be much to live for. The fortune of the family would be secure, but the zest of it would be gone if John Waitman had to give up the assurance of perpetuating his name and his principles in his son. It was a bitter disappointment, and he felt that he had not deserved it. He rose from the chair and paced the room with leaden feet. For the first time in his life, his age was visibly upon him. His head was heavy and hot, and the thoughts that rolled in it were confused and depressing. Could it be that he had made a mistake in the principles of his existence? There was no argument in what Harold had said. It was almost childish, and yet it had shaken the elder man more deeply than he cared to show. It held a silent attack, which touched him more than open criticism. Suppose the end of his life were nearer than he thought. The end must come sometime. What if it were now? Had he not founded his house upon a rock? Had he not kept the commandments? Was he not touching the law blameless? And beyond this, 
even if there were some faults in his character, and all men are sinners, yet he surely believed in the saving doctrines of religion. The forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. Yes, that was the true source of comfort after all. He would read a bit in the Bible, as he did every night, and go to bed and to sleep. He went back to his chair at the library table. A strange weight of weariness rested upon him, but he opened the book at a familiar place, and his eyes fell upon the verse at the bottom of the page. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. That had been the text of the sermon a few weeks before. Sleepily, heavily, he tried to fix his mind upon it and recall it. What was it that Dr. Snodgrass had said? Ah, yes, that it was a mistake to pause here in reading the verse. We must read on without pause. Lay not up treasures upon earth, where moth and rust do corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. That was the true doctrine. We may have treasure upon earth, but they must not be put into an unsafe place, but into safe places. A most comforting doctrine. He had always followed it. Moths and rust and thieves had done no harm to his investments. John Waitman's drooping eyes turned to the next verse at the top of the second column. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven. Now what had the doctor said about that? How was it to be understood? In what sense? Treasures in heaven? The book seemed to float away from him. The light vanished. He wondered dimly if this could be death coming so suddenly, so quietly, so irresistibly. He struggled for a moment to hold himself up and then sank slowly forward upon the table. His head rested upon his folded hands. He slipped into the unknown. How long afterward conscious life returned to him, he did not know. The blank might have been an hour or a century. He knew only that something had happened in the interval. What it was, he could not tell. He found great difficulty in catching the thread of his identity again. He felt that he was himself, but the trouble was to make his connections, to verify and place himself, to know who and where he was. At last it grew clear. John Waitman was sitting on a stone not far from a road in a strange land. The road was not a formal highway, fenced and graded. It was more like a great travel trace, worn by thousands of feet passing across the open country in the same direction. From the edge of the hill where John Waitman sat, he could see travelers in little groups or larger companies gathering from time to time by the different paths and making the ascent. They were all clothed in white, and the form of their garments was strange to him. It was like some old picture. They passed him group after group, talking quietly together or singing, not moving in haste, but with a certain air of eagerness and joy as if they were glad to be on their way to an appointed place. They did not stay to speak to him, but they looked at him often and spoke to one another as they looked, and now and then one of them would smile and beckon him a friendly greeting, so that he felt they would like him to be with them. There was quite an interval between the groups, and he followed each of them with his eyes after it had passed. For a long time, he sat there watching and wondering. It was a very different world from that in which his mansion on the avenue was built, and it looked strange to him, but most real, as real as anything he'd ever seen. Presently, he felt a strong desire to know what country it was and where the people were going. He had a faint premonition of what it must be, but he wished to be sure. So he rose from the stone where he was sitting and came down through short grass and lavender flowers toward a passing group of people. One of them turned to meet him and held out his hand. It was an old man under whose white beard and brows John Waitman thought he saw a suggestion of the face of the village doctor who had cared for him years ago when he was a boy in the country. Welcome, said the old man. Will you come with us? Where are you going? to the heavenly city to see our mansions there. And who are these with you? Strangers to me until a little while ago. I know them better now, but you I've known for a long time, John Waitman. Don't you remember your old doctor? 
<laughs> yes, he cried. Yes, your voice has not changed at all. I'm glad indeed to see you, Dr. McLean, especially now. All this seems very strange to me, almost oppressive. I wonder if, but may I go with you, do you suppose? Surely, answered the doctor with a familiar smile. It will do you good. And you also must have a mansion in the city waiting for you, a fine one too. Are you not looking forward to it? Yes, replied the other, hesitating a moment. Yes, I believe it must be so, although I had not expected to see it so soon. But I will go with you, and we can talk by the way. The two men quickly caught up with the other people, and all went forward together along the road. The doctor had little to tell of his experience, for it had been a plain, hard life, uneventfully spent for others, and the story of the village was very simple. John Waitman's adventure and triumphs would have made a far richer, more imposing history, full of contacts with the great events and personages of the time. But somehow or other, he did not care to speak much about it, walking on that wide, heavenly moorland, under the tranquil, sunless arch of blue, in that free air of perfect peace, where the light was diffused without a shadow, as if the spirit of life in all things was luminous. There was only one person beside the doctor in that little company whom John Waitman had known before, an old bookkeeper who had spent his life over a desk, carefully keeping accounts, a rusty, dull little man, patient and narrow, whose wife had been in the insane asylum for 20 years, and whose only child was a crippled daughter for whose comfort and happiness he had toiled and sacrificed himself without stint. It was a surprise to find him here, as carefree and joyful as the rest. The others in the company were revealed in brief glimpses as they talked. A mother, early widowed, who had kept her little flock of children together and labored through hard and heavy years to bring them up in purity and knowledge. A sister of charity, who had devoted herself to the nursing of poor folk who were being eaten to death by cancer. A schoolmaster, whose heart and life had been poured into his quiet work of training boys for a clean and thoughtful manhood. A medical missionary who had given up a brilliant career in science to take the charge of a hospital in darkest Africa. A beautiful woman with silver hair who had resigned her dreams of love and marriage to care for an invalid father, and after his death had made her life a long, steady search for ways of doing kindnesses to others. A poet who had walked among the crowded tenements of the great city, bringing cheer and comfort not only by his songs, but by his wise and patient works of practical aid. A paralyzed woman who had lain for 30 years upon her bed, helpless but not hopeless, succeeding by a miracle of courage in her single aim, never to complain, but always to impart a bit of her joy and peace to everyone who came near her. All these and other persons like them, people of little consideration in the world, but now seemingly all full of great contentment and an inward gladness that made their steps light, were in the company that passed along the road, talking together of things past and things to come, and singing now and then with great voices from which the veil of age and sorrow was lifted. So they came to the summit of the moorland and looked over into the world beyond. It was a vast green plain, softly rounded like a shallow vase and circled with hills of amethyst. A broad, shining river flowed through it, and many silver threads of water were woven across the green, and there were borders of tall trees on the banks of the river, and orchards full of roses of bloom along the little streams, and in the midst of all stood the city, white wonderful and radiant. When the travelers saw it, they were filled with awe and joy. They passed over the little streams and among the orchards quickly and silently, as they feared to speak, lest the city should vanish. The wall of the city was very low. A child could see over it, for it was made only of precious stones, which are never large. The gate of the city was not like a gate at all, for it was not barred with iron or wood, but only a single pearl, softly gleaming, marked the place where the wall ended and the entrance lay open. A person stood there whose face was bright and grave, whose robe was like the flower of the lily, not a woven fabric, but a living texture. Come in, he said to the company of travelers. You are at your journey's end, 
and your mansions are ready for you. They pass from street to street among fair and spacious dwellings set in amaranthine gardens and adorned with an infinitely varied beauty of divine simplicity. The mansions differed in size, in shape, in charm. Each one seemed to have its own personal look of loveliness. Yet all were alike in fitness to their place, in harmony with one another, in the addition which each made to the singular and tranquil splendor of the city. As the little company came one by one to the mansions which were prepared for them, and their guide beckoned to the happy inhabitants to enter in and take possession, there was a soft murmur of joy, half wonder and half recognition, as if the new and immortal dwelling were crowned with the beauty of surprise, lovelier and nobler than all the dreams of it had been, and yet also as if it were touched with the beauty of the familiar, the remembered, the long-loved. One after another, the travelers were led to their own mansions and went in gladly, and from within, through the open doorways, came sweet voices of welcome and low laughter and song. At last, there was no one left with the guide but the two old friends, Dr. McLean and John Waitman. They were standing in front of one of the largest and fairest of the houses, whose garden glowed softly with radiant flowers. The guide laid his hands upon the doctor's shoulder. This is for you, he said. Go in. There is no more pain here, no more death, nor sorrow, nor tears, for your old enemies are all conquered. But all the good that you have done for others, and all the help you have given, all the comfort that you have brought, and all the strength and love that you have bestowed upon the suffering, are here, for we have built them all into this mansion for you. The good man's face was lighted with a still joy. He clasped his old friend's hand closely and whispered, How wonderful it is! Go on, you will come to your mansion next. It is not far away, and we shall see each other again soon, very soon. So he went through the garden and into the music within. The keeper of the gate turned to John Waitman with level, quiet, searching eyes. Then he asked gravely, Where do you wish me to lead you now? To see my own mansion, answered the man with half-concealed excitement. Is there not one here for me? You may not let me enter it yet, perhaps, for I must confess to you that I am only... I know, said the keeper of the gate. I know it all. You are John Waitman. Yes, said the man, more firmly than he had spoken at first, for it gratified that his name was known. Yes, I'm John Waitman, senior warden of St. Petronius Church. I wish very much to see my mansion here, if only for a moment. I believe you have one for me. Will you take me to it? The keeper of the gate drew a little book from the breast of his robe and turned over the pages. Certainly, he said, with a curious look at the man. Your name is here, and you shall see your mansion if you will follow me. It seemed as if they must have walked miles and miles through the vast city, passing street after street of houses larger and smaller, of gardens richer and poorer, but all full of beauty and delight. They came into a kind of suburb where there were many small cottages with plots of flowers, very lovely, but bright and fragrant. Finally, they reached an open field, bare and lonely looking. There were two or three little bushes in it without flowers, and the grass was sparse and thin. In the center of the field was a tiny hut, hardly big enough for a shepherd's shelter. It looked as if it had been built of discarded things, scraps and fragments of other buildings, put together with care and pains by someone who had tried to make the most of cast-off material. There was something pitiful and shamefaced about the hut. It shrank and drooped and faded in its barren field, and seemed to cling only by sufferance to the edge of the splendid city. This, said the keeper of the gate, standing still and speaking with a low, distinct voice, This is your mansion, John Waitman. An almost intolerable shock of grieved wonder and indignation choked the man for a moment so that he could not say a word. Then he turned his face away from the poor little hut and began to remonstrate eagerly with his companion. Surely, sir, he stammered, you must be in error about this. There's something wrong. Some other John Waitman, a confusion of names. 
The book must be mistaken. There is no mistake, said the keeper of the gate very calmly. Here is your name, the record of your title and your possessions in this place. But how could such a house be prepared for me, cried the man with a resentful tremor in his voice. For me, after my long and faithful service. Is this a suitable mansion for one so well known and devoted? Why, it is so pitifully small and mean. Why have you not built it large and fair like the others? This is all the material you sent us. What? We have used all the material that you sent us, repeated the keeper of the gate. Now I know you are mistaken, cried the man with growing earnestness. For all my long life, I've been doing things that must have supplied you with material. Have you not heard that I built a schoolhouse, the wing of a hospital, two, yes, three small churches, and the greater part of the large one, the spire of St. Patro, the keeper of the gate, lifted his hand. Wait, he said, we know these things. They are not ill done, but they were all marked and used as foundation for the name and mansion of John Whiteman in the world. Did you not plan them for that? Yes, answered the man, confused and taken aback. I confess that I thought often of them in that way. Perhaps my heart was set upon that too much. But there are other things. My endowment for the college, my steady and liberal contributions to all the established charities, my support of every respectable. Wait, said the keeper of the gate again. Were not all these carefully recorded on earth where they could add to your credit? They were not foolishly done. Verily, you've had your reward for them. Would you be paid twice? No, cried the man with deepening dismay. I dare not claim that. I acknowledge that I considered my own interest too much, but surely not altogether. You've said that these things were not foolishly done. They accomplished some good in the world. Does not that count for something? Yes, answered the keeper of the gate. It counts in the world where you counted it. But it does not belong to you here. We have saved and used everything that you sent us. This is the mansion prepared for you. As he spoke, his look grew deeper and more searching, like a flame of fire. John Whiteman could not endure it. It seemed to strip him naked and wither him. He sank to the ground under a crushing weight of shame, covering his eyes with his hands and cowering face downward upon the stones. Dimly, through the trouble of his mind, he felt their hardness and coldness. Tell me then, he cried brokenly, since my life has been so little worth, how came I here at all? Through the mercy of the king, the answer was like the soft tolling of a bell. And how have I earned it, he murmured. It is never earned, it is only given, came the clear, low reply. But how have I failed so wretchedly, he asked, in all the purpose of my life? What could I have done better? What is it that counts here? Only that which is truly given, answered the bell-like voice. Only that good which is done for the love of doing it. Only those plans in which the welfare of others is the master thought. Only those labors in which the sacrifice is greater than the reward. Only those gifts in which the giver forgets himself. The man lay silent. A great weakness, an unspeakable despondency of humiliation were upon him. But the face of the keeper of the gate was infinitely tender as he bent over. Think again, John Waitman. Has there been nothing like that in your life? Nothing, he sighed. If there ever were such things, it must have been long ago. They were all crowded out. I've forgotten them. There was an ineffable smile on the face of the keeper of the gate, and his hand made the sign of the cross over the bowed head as he spoke gently. These are the things that the king never forgets, and because there were a few of them in your life, you have a little place here. The sense of coldness and hardness under John Waitman's hands grew sharper and more distinct. The feeling of bodily weariness and lassitude weighed upon him, but there was a calm, 
almost a lightness in his heart as he listened to the fading vibrations of the silvery bell tones. The chimney clock on the mantel had just ended the last stroke of seven as he lifted his head from the table. Thin, pale strips of the city morning were falling into the room through the narrow partings of the heavy curtains. What was it that had happened to him? Had he been ill? Had he died and come to life again? Or had he only slept and had his soul gone visiting in the dreams? He sat for some time motionless, not lost, but finding himself in thought. Then he took a narrow book from the table drawer, wrote a check, and tore it out. He went slowly up the stairs, knocked very softly at his son's door, and hearing no answer, entered without noise. Harold was asleep, his bare arm thrown above his head, and his eager face relaxed in peace. His father looked at him a moment with strangely shining eyes, then tiptoed quietly to the writing desk, found a pencil and a sheet of paper, and wrote rapidly, My dear boy, here's what you ask me for. Do what you like with it, and ask for more if you need it. If you're still thinking of that work with Grenfell, we'll talk it over today after church. I want to know your heart better, and if I have made mistakes. A slight noise made him turn his head. Harold was sitting up in his bed with wide open eyes. Father, he cried, is that you? Yes, my son, answered John Waitman. I've come back. I mean, I've come up. No, I mean, come in. Well, here I am. And God give us a good Christmas together. It's easy to do our good deeds in such a way that people know all about it. Even if we just drop hints as to what we did, we want everyone to know how charitable we are. But we have it from the highest source that that's not the way to do it. Jesus said, be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues or on the streets, to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Matthew 6, 1 through 4. Thanks for listening. I love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.